Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 20th meeting of 2018. Their apologies from Maurice Corey. Agenda item one is a decision on taking item six in private. Are we all agreed to take item six, which is consideration of our approach to a bill in private? Agreed. We all agreed, thank you. Uh, ag agenda item two is a round table evidence session on professional legal education. This is committee's first consideration of this topic. It's an opportunity to explore the issues relating to legal education, including routes to qualifying as a solicitor and advocate, funding and barriers to entry uh, to these professions. I refer members to paper one, which is not by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And can I welcome all of the witnesses to the committee's roundtable evidence session and invite them in turn to introduce themselves briefly. And I'll start with Margaret Mitchell, convener of the Justice Committee, and if we just go round the table. Gail Scott, one of the clerks to the committee. And Stephen Emery, the clerk to the Justice Committee. Jenny Gilruth, MSP for Mid Fife and Glenorthis. I'm Tim Haddow. I'm a, an advocate. I came through the route to qualification, qualifying as solicitor in 2015 and as an advocate in 2016, but I had a particular interest in access to the profession and I campaigned on that issue whilst I was a student and also worked on it whilst the trainee solicitor. Ben McPherson, MSP for Edinburgh Northern Leith. I also like to take this opportunity to declare two interests. Uh, first of all, that I'm a registered solicitor. Uh, and also that during my uh, diploma and uh, well, j just during the diploma year, I was also a, a member of the campaign for fair access to the legal profession, uh, working with yeah. Tim Haddo. Yes, <clears throat> my judicial title is Lord E.C. My real name is Ronald Mackay. Uh, and I'm here in my capacity as the convener of the Joint Standing Committee on Legal Education. Now, Kavina, I don't know if you would like me to say something about the committee now, or shall I come back to it later? Maybe something briefly just now wouldn't yes. do any harm. Well, the Joint Standing Committee on Legal Education in Scotland has been around for a good number of decades, although quite when we were set up was a bit, a bit of a mystery. But our function is to bring together uh, the professional bodies, the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society uh, and the law schools in Scotland in order really that they can work together constructively and in a cooperative manner uh, in the interests of legal education throughout. Um, in addition to those bodies, we also have representation from the Diploma Coordinating Committee and we have a representation too from the Judicial Institute, which is of course responsible for the training of the judiciary, and now of course includes the Justices of the Peace. And uh, we are assisted in our work by three lay members. That's a relatively recent introduction to the committee. And I have to say that uh, I think the working of the committee has been greatly assisted by the presence of the lay members. We really do appreciate the effort which they put into us. That, that was helpful because when we're having the discussion and bringing people in, then you know when it's, it's relevant um, to, to bring you in. Thank you very much for so, that. Yes, so, so my role is really the convener of that rather than presenting a particular interest Trist. on the committee. I understand. John. Uh, Martin, good morning, John Finney, MSP, Highlands and Islands. Uh, I'm Rob Mars, Head of Education at the Law Society of Scotland. I'm Liam MacArthur, MSP for Orkney, and probably ought to declare an interest as a parent of um, a son who's about to go off and study law at Dundee. Um, we'll just Liam Kerr for the North East, MSP for the North East Region. Um, I also need to declare an interest as a member of the Law Societies of England and Wales and Scotland. I'm a current practicing uh, solicitor. Uh, and importantly for uh, a conversation on access, I self-funded my way uh, through the Common Professional Exam and the Legal Practice Certificate at what is now the University of Law in London uh, and then dual qualified into Scotland a few years later. And I'm Julie Brannan, Director of Education and Training at the Solicitors Regulation Authority, and the SRA is the regulator of law firms in England and Wales. I'm Marie Goujon, I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mearns. I'm George Adam, Paisley's MSP. 
I'm Liz Camerford. Um, I was formerly a solicitor in private practice, and I'm still on the solicitor's role, albeit non-practicing. My role now is as the Diploma Director at Dundee University, where I um, coordinate the Diploma in Professional Legal Practice. I'm Daniel Johnson, MSP for Edinburgh Southern, and, and I'd also just like to add that my wife is a practicing solicitor, having qualified via law conversion in England, and then subsequently uh, 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 qualified in, in, in Scotland, and is therefore dual qualified. And Rona Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Bearsden. Thank you all for that. That's very helpful. Um, it's a roundtable discussion, so it's a more informal uh, way of still collecting formal evidence on, on the topic, but allowing for a more free exchange and, um, and, and hopefully to go in different directions that you, you don't always manage to do if you have a more structured panel on an issue. If you do want to speak, then your microphone will come on automatically once you've attracted my attention or the clerk's attention and we'll bring you in. And as usual, we'll try and give us as much and, and most of the time to our witnesses as opposed to the members, although I know they have a lot of questions to ask on, on that. Um, can I thank all the witnesses that did uh, provide written evidence? That's always tremendously helpful to the committee in advance of holding, holding a formal session. And without further ado, we'll now move to our first question, which is from Liam MacArthur. Much, uh, it's a very General question, obviously we've, we've had a, a note in terms of the various stages involved in qualifying as a solicitor and advocate. It would be helpful um, if uh, some of the witnesses could set out what's involved in each of those stages, what are the key learnings um, that uh, are attached to each of those uh, stages, both as a solicitor but also as an advocate. Who thinks it would be best place to give a kind of overview of the, of the training? Legal education and training in Scotland. Yes, <laughs> Law Society. Thank you. So the 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 main route, the the route that the vast majority of people take is by undertaking the uh, LLB. That's normally four years for an honours degree. It's possible to do in in three, but the vast majority will do it in four. That's the academic stage to the route to qualification. And uh, we set a series of we the law society set a series of outcomes that require to be be taught by um, universities and require to be met by students. How universities teach those outcomes will be up to the universities. There's a bit of academic freedom for them there. Um, it's important to remember that depending on the university, between 40 and 50 percent of the people who study the LLB will not go on to further legal study, uh, that may be a decision they take at the start of the LLB, <laughs> they never want to be a lawyer. Um, it may be a decision they take halfway through, saying, I wanted to become a lawyer, and now I definitely don't. Um, uh, or at the end, there may be other reasons as well, as I'm sure we'll come on to, but th that's quite an important thing, uh, that it's, it's not uh, solely for legal practice. Once you've done that, the, and that covers, as I say, the academic stage, you go on to uh, study the diploma in professional legal practice. Uh, again, we accredit that, and again, we set outcomes that require to be to be met there. Up to 50% of the course is what we call elective, which again gives uh, providers significant freedom to uh, play to their strengths as a provider, um, but also to link into their local market. So perhaps uh, the most obvious example is the universities in Aberdeen that offer the diploma uh, may well tailor their um, provision to the local energy, oil and gas sectors, um, but all diploma providers do that to their, 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 their locations. Uh, the other 50% that, that, that we mandate uh, is core content, and that ties directly to the reserved areas of practice for a solicitor, so private client uh, litigation uh, and elements of, uh, of property and conveyancing, as well as that tax is taught on the diploma, it's taught pervasively. Uh, it may be taught at undergrad, but it's, it has to be taught pervasively at the diploma. And then in, uh, and legal ethics are also, they may be introduced in the uh, LLB, but they are mandated to be taught throughout the diploma. Then there's a training contract, uh, which can either be with a private practice firm uh, from a, a one a sole practitioner all the way up to one of the largest law firms in the world, or it could be a private, uh, an in-house organization the biggest single hirer of trainees is the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a broad spread. Again, we set outcomes that require to be met. 
uh, over the course of the two years. They're quite broad uh, because uh, negotiation for a large corporate firm maybe uh, have a similar underlying skill to negotiation as a, a procurator fiscal, but you don't want to go too deep into it because otherwise it, it becomes difficult. Um, and uh, at, throughout that, there are regular quarterly performance reviews. They are required to undertake trainee continuing professional development, and they're required to meet the outcomes and, of course, be uh, designated by a disclosure check and by their supervising solicitor to be a fit and proper person to be a solicitor in Scotland. And then at that point, uh, or they can be admitted halfway through their training contract, at the end they're discharged and they are a newly qualified solicitor and they can go off to work in wherever they want in the profession or go to the bar. And I don't think I can speak for how advocates become advocates, but Tim can jump in there, I'm sure. Be before we move on, and you said three, three or four years, is this still graduate entry and two-year course? Yeah, very, uh, yes, actually. Um, there, there is, um, there is a, a graduate LLB, um, which generally, yes, it's two years. Generally, it need, uh, you need to have undertaken a, a previous degree to get there. Uh, there are occasionally exceptions for that if you have significant work-based learning or something like that. But on the whole, somebody will do a, an undergrad in history, politics, English, science, and then move across to do a two-year accelerated. Um, a number of universities do that. It's a, uh, one university now does that online, uh, and pretty much all of the root parts of the roots qualification are also available to be undertaken part-time as well. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And it's interesting that people don't always do the degree uh, with, uh, with the intention of practicing. It's being looked at generally as a good general degree to have to go into a lot of different professions. Unless any of the witnesses have anything to add to the training, then I think we'll move on to the more um, substantive questions. Yes, uh, Tim, you wanted to add something? Yes. Yes, well, I think uh, I should say, first of all, I'm not here to give evidence on behalf of the Faculty of Advocates, but also I can speak to the process of qualifying as an advocate. Um, I think the first two things just to acknowledge is that the scale of that is very much lower in that perhaps between four and ten people a year train as advocates compared to you know, four or five hundred who would train as solicitors. Um, it's also worth noting there's a great diversity of people. There's usually one or two a year who come straight from having qualified as solicitors, but equally there's will be others who will have worked as solicitors for a number of years, and indeed some who will have worked as solicitors for a very significant period of time, and who come to the bar, perhaps instead of becoming a partner in a law firm, or even having been a partner in a law firm and wanting to do something completely different. So the sort of profile of people coming into the advocate's profession is, is quite different than those coming in at the solicitor's profession at the bottom end. But put very simply, the requirements in Scotland to become an advocate um, sort of bolt on to the top of having become a solicitor. So the, the law degree requirements, they don't qu they're not quite identical, but they're very similar. Um, you then have to do the diploma. You then have to have qualified as a solicitor. There are some routes around that, but they're very sort of few and far between. Um, so generally people do effectively what I did, which is go through, do the law degree, the diploma, the traineeship, and then either come straight to the bar or go through the, um, the other process, the um, practice as a solicitor first. I think the actual process of training as an advocate is that you spend a year, um, what in England's called pupillage, in Scotland we call it devilling. Um, so you work for about nine months uh, alongside shadowing experienced advocates. During that time, you receive some fairly specialist and intensive advocacy training from members of faculty, uh, and at the end of that, if you meet the right standards, you're then admitted by the court to the Office of Advocate. Um, it is worth saying that th that period of training you don't have to pay for, but of course neither are you paid for doing it. So it is um, people will have to plan ahead for that. Um, there are scholarships available, and, and those have been in, or will be from next year very much enhanced over what they have been up till now. That's, that's very helpful. Um, before we move on to look at an overview of the education in England and Wales, which Daniel's going to explore then, Liam, both Liam's had a yeah, I just had a, a following on from um, Rob's explanation, was very helpful. I'm aware that not all universities um, offer the diploma as well. 
I mean, it would be helpful maybe to understand the extent to which um, there is, is movement from um, universities in completely different parts of the country in order to complete the diploma. So that if, um, for example, you, you use the example of Aberdeen, whether people with an interest in the energy sector are going to gravitate there to do a diploma, or whether um, the likelihood is that people will do the diploma if they can at the university they've got their degree from. Courses for courses to an extent. Um, sometimes people will move away for their undergrad. So if you're originally from Glasgow, you may go to Aberdeen or Edinburgh, but you may return home, so to speak, to do your diploma at either Glasgow or Strathclyde. Um, you're right that not all of the LLB providing universities also offer the diploma. Ten, we uh, accredit ten LLB providers. There are six providers of the diploma. Um, so obviously that doesn't map entirely. There is a bit of movement. It may be on an educational basis. It may be because you desperately want to do a particular area of law or a particular um, elective. It may be because you can live at home and that's cheaper. It may be, um, but some people do continue. They do Edinburgh, Edinburgh or Dundee, Dundee because they, they like being there and it works for them. Uh, Liz will be far better placed than that. In respect of um, the varying reasons, the predominant reason that I see uh, in, in my, my role is that people often move back, students often move back to their hometown to undertake the diploma course, which is essentially a, a year's postgraduate course in order to save costs. That's a common re reason for movement. Some people are driven by electives offered by the individual diploma providers, such as, you know, Rob cited the, the oil and gas situation in Aberdeen. If that's a particular interest, people are aware of what might be on offer at universities through their websites, and often that's a, a swaying uh, in their decision. Because some universities may be more geared to technical and look at youthing forward, others more traditional. So Absolutely. that might be a, a yeah. factor in, in looking at and it. And certainly we always tend to look at emerging areas of law that are relevant to give our, our diploma students the best kind of job opportunities in terms of going into practice where they are locally. And supplementary, Liam? Just very briefly, Mr Haddow, if I may, um, just to be clear. So in Scotland, if one wants to become an advocate, uh, you run a pro the, the standard process to become a lawyer that Rob Mars described. Uh, you then do your two-year training contract with a law firm, let's say, and then you will decide, can I afford a one-year unpaid devilling with a view to becoming an advocate? Uh, and if I'm right on that, that I think contrasts very heavily with the England and Wales situation, doesn't it, in, insofar as if one is running through, uh, instead of doing the LPC, one decides to do a bar vocational course for a year, and then two years of pupillage? One year. One year of pupillage, unpaid. So, so the unpaid period runs throughout your legal education in England and Wales in a way that it doesn't in Scotland, is that? Um, I'm not particularly familiar with the um, system in England, uh, and maybe Julie, um, Ms Brendan can help. I think the pupillage... Now there's a mandatory sort of minimum award for pupils. The pupils will receive about £12,000 a year during their year of pupillage. But that the bar practice training course, um, which I think is the new name for the bar vocational course you mentioned, um, that costs around £16,000. Uh, in, Sco in Scotland, you don't have to do the course, you, but you will already have paid to do your diploma. I think the, 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 the difference is, of course, that, you know, a lot of people don't come straight to the bar um, in Scotland, and that's not just because they can't afford to do so, although it, that might be a consideration for other people, but people, well, people, as Robert says, horses for courses, some people, it's, they want to work as a solicitor first, sometimes they develop their interest in advocacy as they go through their profession, other people might want to do it straight away, other people might have family or other reasons um, for, for, for doing it or for delaying coming to the bar. Um, so certainly in the year that I called as an advocate, there were three of us who had, had been Scottish qualified through the Scottish solicitors route. I had come straight from a traineeship. One of my colleagues had done three years in practice and then two years working for one of the judges. The other of my colleagues um, had been in practice for about 15 years and bizarrely I'd been his trainee when I'd worked in the law firm and we then devilled together. Um, so it's a very much horses for courses. Okay, moving on, Daniel. I'll just be, you know, having had that outline of how uh, one can qualify in Scotland, just be interested to do the, the compare and contrast with, with uh, England and Wales 
uh, both in terms of the, the, the uh, academic requirement in terms of that university portion, then also sort of the, the, the uh, equivalent of the, the diploma and, and also the postgraduate routes and just how that compares in England com uh, in comparison to Scotland. Um, could I perhaps ask, ask you, Julia, for that? Yes, certainly. Um, <coughs> broadly, a very similar structure at the moment. So we also have a tripartite system. We have the academic stage of training, which is either uh, a law degree or uh, another degree, and then uh, the common professional examination, as, as Liam described. Uh, then we have uh, for solicitors the legal practice course, and as you've heard for barristers the BPTC, um, and then we have the, um, a, a training contract. Uh, and to give you a sense of the numbers coming through, certainly on the solicitor side, um, as is well known, the number of, of, of uh, students in England and Wales has increased enormously in recent years. Um, there are now about 26,000 law students starting each year on a law degree. Um, and there are about five to 6,000 training contracts at the end of that process. So you can see the sort of the funnel. Uh, and that's, um, you, in, you have to add into that the fact that uh, we have a large number of people coming through the non-law degree route, and particularly going into the elite law firms, about 50% of the people that they recruit into the, the big city law firms are non-law graduates. So it's very, very competitive to get those training contracts at the end. Um, and as I'm sure um, I'll go on to describe in, the moment, in a moment, we are proposing really a very radical overhaul to that system where we will uh, um, have a, a national licensing exam called the solicitor's qualifying exam uh, that everybody will take regardless of their route to admission um, and we will no longer specify particular pathways that people have to follow. Just coming back to those proportions, how does that compare to Scotland in terms of the, we heard sort of 26 thousand was it to, to five thousand training contracts is that a, a similar funnel or is it a narrower funnel in in, in scotland and and similarly my, my understanding that currently in england essentially it's a, it's a one year postgraduate qualification before you do your legal practice certificate um whereas it's two years in scotland could someone just explain to me kind of why that's the case <coughs> so the the numbers are not uh aren't comparable um, the rough numbers we we say uh, when when people ask us are around 1,300 law students commence across the 10 providers each year. Um, obviously, there'll be some level of uh, attrition over the course of the four years with people dropping out of a degree, which which happens in all degrees to some extent or other. Um, and we we generally think it moves around year on year, but a, a good rule of thumb is about a thousand law graduates each year. Um, the diploma last year, 612 people started, I think. Of course, you don't necessarily do one following the other. You may take some time out, but, you know, just for the numbers. And then last year, there were 540 or so training contracts, and that's been remarkably similar over the last four years. The numbers of training contracts have been between 530 and 550. So who knows what's going to happen in the, the near future, but that's, that's the numbers. So if you look at that, the funnel, so to speak, it, it's not comparable. Yes, just to add, um, uh, uh, of course, the, the reason for the disparity in, in university places is that, as I understand it, in, in Scotland, uh, places at university are capped. Uh, whereas in England, they're not capped at all. So universities can recruit as many people as they want to go into uh, their courses. And indeed, we have a number of Scottish universities, including, I think, Dundee, who offer what we call a qualifying law degree for uh, purposes of admission as an English solicitor. So you can go to a Scottish university and do a degree in law in a Scottish university and then come south of the border, and uh, we recognise that degree and qualify as an English solicitor. <coughs> Can I just also ask us about this solicitor's qualifying exam that's coming in? You said that that's that sort of um, agnostic about the route. I mean, is that, are, you, are you saying that literally you can do whatever you like as long as you pass the exam? You can, I mean, a bit like kind of you know, taking the bar exam in, in the States. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that, is that the, the, the idea? In a nutshell, it is absolutely the idea. We do have, actually, the, I've described the most common route to admission as a solicitor uh, of England and Wales at the moment, but we have uh, a large number of routes. And what we've tried to do is, is to inject some flexibility into the system by having alternative pathways to admission. And, of course, we have the overseas route to admission as, as a solicitor. And the problem we have at the moment is each different route to admission has its own 
assessment. And we can't really justify having different assessments for admission depending on the route you happen to have chosen. So instead, we think we need one single uh, system test to check that people have the competencies to practice safely as a solicitor. We will have a requirement that by the time you're admitted as a solicitor, you have to have a degree or equivalent qualification. So we do expect that uh, practice as a solicitor will continue to be predominantly uh, gradu a graduate profession as it has been in the past. It's never been an exclusively graduate profession and it will continue not to be a, an exclusively graduate profession. But we think that <clears throat> by focusing our regulation on a really rigorous assessment at point of admission, we can then inject flexibility into the roots of, of pathways to admission. We can, for example, have people qualifying through apprenticeships, which we've already started, uh, uh, and we can have, we can, uh, there'll, there'll be greater opportunities for people to learn while they earn, and so on. Greater flexibility, but we will have actually a better, more rigorous check of competence at point of admission than we have at the moment. So my colleague John Finney is going to come <coughs> back to that point later on, but can I just quickly, uh, as a get the kind of the, the view from Scottish colleagues is that uh, idea of having a sort of a, a, a test rather than looking at the means how people arrive there is something that, 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 that Scottish the Scottish legal profession looks on with envy or revulsion uh, as, a, as an idea if I can put it glibly I we tend to deal in things like uh, we don't tend to say envy or revulsion um, but um, We've uh, engaged very positively with the SRA on this. We've responded to, I think, three consultations now on this, and we've, we've put our views across. At, at this stage, uh, we, we have no plans to, to mirror what the, the SRA are, are doing. Uh, obviously, we watch with interest what is happening south of the border, um, but it's not our direction of travel. I, I would say um, that uh, you know, we are a, a, a professional body and there are many cross-border entities now uh, that will operate in both jurisdictions. Um, we haven't seen any significant push from, from anyone really to, to, to go down that route. That isn't to say it's, it's wrong to do so, it's just to, to state a fact that, that that's, we're not being pushed in that direction. Where our members are keen to innovate, uh, as I said in my written evidence, is that they are keen uh, for us to uh, create a truly alternative, there are elements of the route uh, to qualification that can be alternative, but to create a truly alternative route via means of an apprenticeship to route to qualification. Um, large sections of the membership are, are keen to do that. We're keen to do that. Um, you consulted on it last year. You know, um, so uh, we have no real plans to go down the single uh, or actually two stage assessment of SQE1, SQE2, uh, or that, that model. But in terms of an apprenticeship, we'd be very keen to continue that. And we, we're speaking to Skills Development Scotland about doing just that. You'd be very well qualified to answer this one. Yes, I to say, of course, the committee is very aware uh, of uh, what is being proposed in England, and we've given it quite careful consideration. Uh, and I can say that none of the constituent bodies uh, are in favour of, as it were, going down that route. Uh, there are a number of reasons, but if we just take one of them, I mean, one of the drivers for this in England and Wales is uh, seemingly the the great uh, variety of routes and qualifications, uh, and that therefore they see that they're being very inconsistent standards. Now, that is a, a situation which really doesn't exist in Scotland. Um, the structure of the legal profession and the organisation of legal education is, as we've just been learning, very different. Uh, and there's a long tradition of close contact between the universities and the law schools, the law schools and the professions. Uh, and uh, well, I like to think that the Joint Standing Committee has paid some part in this, but we do operate on a constructive and cooperative basis. Uh, and the Law Society of Scotland and indeed the faculty, in a sense, audit what is being done in the universities through the accreditation means. So that way we achieve, uh, I'm not saying everything is identical, but we do achieve uh, consistency and quality in, in the standards. And of course, as between the, the law schools in Scotland, there's a fairly rigorous system of external examiners. So in a sense, they are checking up on each other. So that's one particular reason why we don't see that 
this as a good idea. Can I push a little bit on, on that? Because it sounds a little bit as though you're saying the single uh, system test is almost coming to a lowering of, of standards because people have come into the profession uh, from so many different routes which aren't available in Scotland. Is that I'm what? I'm not sure what I'm saying. I'm saying that one of the, one of the principal reasons as I understand it in England and Wales is the apprehension that there are very varying standards and inconsistency both in the level of teaching and in the rigour of the marking and, and, and standards. And I'm saying we don't have that issue. I don't think there's any perception within Scotland, and there isn't, that there is a great variety of standards between uni universities. I'll bring Julie in, because I would have thought if the test was rigorous enough, regardless of how you'd come into a profession, perhaps that wouldn't be a concern. Julia. Yes, just to give um, a flavour of the concerns that we have over standards, um, we know that we have variable pass rates on both the CP and the LPC. So at some providers, pass rates are as low as 50%, uh, and at others, they're as high as 100%. Now, we don't actually know whether 50% or 100% is, is a good thing. Um, you know, there could be a number of reasons for that. It could be uh, different uh, calibre of, of students. It could be better or, or less good teaching. It could be uh, more, more difficult or easier exams. And we don't know which of those it is. We, about uh, two or three years ago, we did call in all the exams on the LPC so we could look at them and try to get a sense of whether there were differential standards. Um, and what I can say is on the face of it, it looked as though there were. And, and I, should, I should add just to, 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 to give uh, um, members a, an understanding, there are about 26 different legal practice course providers. So we looked at each of the exams of the 26 different legal course providers. It looked as though there were different um, uh, standards in the exams. Some exams looked easier than others. Um, but you, we couldn't really tell that because we didn't know how the students had been taught. We didn't know how, how the teaching related to the examining, whether the questions on the exam papers were, were really very different and novel compared with what they had uh, been exposed to in, in the teaching. So it was very difficult for us to get a grip. And I think w one of the issues that we've got is, is we think there may be differential standards, but actually it's very hard for us to tell. It's hard to know for sure. Um, and we think that the single exam will give us a much better grip uh, on standards. We will know that everybody has been assessed to the same standard because everybody will take the same test. And to pick up on, on the question of external examiners, um, there's quite a lot of interest amongst the regulators of higher education in uh, uh, you know, the QAA, the new office for students, at, about the external examining system. And there are some concerns about the extent to which that actually is is effective. Um, we know that universities tend to select external examiners from the same sector uh, in which they operate. And of course, although the external examiners are required to make a statement that the standards in the university where they are external are the same as their home university, that's only a bilateral test. So, the, so, so the, I think there are some questions and I think the, the regulators are looking at, at the extent to which that is a robust system. Liam MacArthur, did you have a... Uh, Liam Kerr, uh, <coughs> Just uh, something which... I'll, I'll ask this, <coughs> but which m might support what you're saying, Lord E.C., is um, am I not right in thinking... Uh, certainly when I was selecting where to study... This is about getting a training contract, it seems to me. So at the end of my studies, if I want to become a solicitor, I have to get a training contract. And certainly when, it, when in England and Wales, it was clear to me at the time, and this was a long time ago, I accept, uh, but that where I got that training, that the LPC from would probably have an impact on where I could expect to get a training contract. Am I right in thinking, Lord Easy, that because you've only got 10 providers in Scotland, that analysis is, much, is, is less likely to happen as far as it doesn't matter where I go, the law firms are saying it will be of a standard, it will be of a certain level. Yes, I think that's really what it comes to. I could also say that within the committee we do have considerable reservations about the notion of the, the test of a single exam. Uh, I think there's a concern that uh, there's more to becoming a sound lawyer than just sitting one exam. It's the exposure to the academic discipline and the study of legal thinking that will 
make for sound lawyers, and we do actually need sound lawyers. Uh, and there's a, an apprehension which I think is shared also south of the border, uh, that if you set up this single exam, which I think is to be largely computer organized, you end up with uh, crammers teaching to the exam. <laughs> and uh, those who are concerned that that uh, would be uh, not provide the, the, the real measure of assurance of quality for the future profession. And then Rob. I think I'd share the reservations that have been expressed around the table by the, the Scottish uh, witnesses, at least. Um, it certainly doesn't seem to my mind to be the scale of, of problem there is with the diversity of provision. You know, we're talking about six providers rather than 26, and I don't think there's any evidence about this difference in quality or pass rates, at least, which may mean a difference in quality between the providers. So I don't necessarily see an advantage of taking that assessment process away from the universities and giving it to a third party, which I think is effectively what is talking about happening in England. Um, but uh, equally, I think there is, a, there is one aspect of the new system in England which I think is commendable, and it does seem to be less tied to the particular structure of the route to qualification. And I think um, it is an issue that um, the, 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 the primary route for people coming through is in some ways quite prescriptive. So, for instance, you pretty much have to do the diploma, then you have to do the two-year traineeship. Um, so, for instance, when I was going through the diploma process, there was a person who'd worked their way through from you know being the office boy in the solicitor's firm. He'd been there about seven years. He'd gone through his law society exams, so effectively that allowed him to reach the, the legal qualification without having done a law degree. But then to, do, to get to the next stage of qualification, despite having worked in a legal office for seven years, he had to leave his job and come to the diploma to learn about how to work in a legal office. Or, well, it's not just about that, but that's part of the process of the diploma. And then, of course, he had to go and do a traineeship to learn about the practicalities of working in a legal office. And he's already sort of done that. Or indeed for people, and I was slightly in this situation myself, I had 19 years you know, working as a professional in another profession. So some of the skills that I required to work in a legal office, I already had in terms of working in an office, being a professional, all that sort of thing. I didn't have some of the legal bits and pieces. But because the, the current structure is very much a sort of lowest common denominator, it assumes that everybody's starting from that sort of fresh-faced graduate uh, position and has to then follow that particular structure of diploma plus traineeship. So the commendable bit, I think, about what the SRA are trying to do is say, well, let's go away from having to do jump through particular hoops and let's just assess on the outcomes that you get to the end of that. And I think that we could perhaps take some aspects of that you know, process ag agnosticism, I suppose, about how you get to the standard from the English from the English proposals, and there are aspects of that without going the whole hog to uh, to do what the SRA are doing. On that example, Lord AC, you were um, shaking your head vigorously before I bring Rob in, so you wanted to to qualify, maybe, or I think it was the clerk that had you know worked in an office for so long yeah. and, and yet still the, the, had to do the, the diploma. A problem, in a sense, with people who worked in the particular field, they acquire knowledge, but there's also the other side of it that you need to be, I think one has to be anxious to make sure from the point of view of public protection that people are adequately qualified. And if I can take perhaps a, an analogy from medicine that you know, we may have someone who's worked as a, in a paramedical capacity for a very long time is very knowledgeable, but I think the public would still like to know that they have actually gone through the, the same proper route for qualification. There's a balance, in effect, which is sometimes quite difficult uh, to draw between making access easy and yet maintaining the quality. Could, could I ask then, do you have, does your committee have the flexibility to, if you like, 
waiver the rules given an individual case? No, no, we are. That's set down. No, no, no. We are a. We're just a cooperative consultative body. Just bring everyone together, yeah, really. But, so we can facility. argue about it, and we can make suggestions. Right. <laughs> to and we can encourage things, and indeed, you know, one of the things we have been looking at and in trying to encourage is the development of of different routes to qualification. For example, perhaps easing the. Uh, the requirements for traineeships and improving the opportunities for traineeships. Yeah. And I think it's and fair to helpful. say, although perhaps Robert may contradict me, that the Law Society has gone to great lengths to try uh, to open up the traineeship market when encouraging smaller firms, encouraging the public sector uh, to provide traineeships and to making that easier. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, as was mentioned, uh, there's an effort to try and develop the apprenticeship model as a way. So we're, we're not averse to developing uh, other means of, of qualifications. Yeah. I've got Rob, Julia, and then Liz in that order. Rob. Super. Uh, just a, a few points. Uh, I think it's y useful to note, uh, Daniel asked um, uh, about the, the, the funnel beforehand. It, it's useful to remember that we, we are very different jurisdictions and very different educational uh, jurisdictions. We have 10 LLB providers, the SRA, so far as I, I'm aware, are over 100, I think over 110. Um, regulating 110 academic institutions is just more difficult than, uh, than regulating uh, 10 and then subsequently six in the way of the diploma. Um, I can tell you how we accredit and uh, uh, continually monitor uh, providers, but perhaps uh, Liz, as somebody that we accredit and monitor, may be better at doing that from, from that side. Um, uh, I you know, the, the, the points uh, Tim makes are, are fair. Um, we are looking at how we can can make processes more flexible. As I've mentioned, the, the apprenticeship route is something that we, we are exceptionally keen on. And that has, this isn't, you know, me sitting in uh, Morrison Street thinking it's a good idea. It's the profession uh, asking us to do so. And then thirdly, in terms of promoting traineeships, um, the the biggest single change that we are looking to do this year is to rewrite the admission regulations, which we are currently doing. We are the, the body that sets the admission regulations with the concurrence of the Lord President at the Court of Session. Um, but one of the things that we would like to do, subject to necessary safeguards being put in place, would be allow trainees to be admitted earlier in the training contract. Um, if they were able to do that, um, particularly small criminal defence firms would be able to, would be more able, rather, to take on trainee solicitors. Because at the moment, if you're a criminal defence firm, um, if you take on a trainee solicitor, they cannot appear in, in many court matters until point of admission, which at the present time is, as, is at its earliest of one year. If we could move that earlier, and that's just uneconomical. Uh, of course, there's huge public protection issues there, so we're, we'd have to put in safeguards in place around that. But that's one of the things we're looking at under the new admission regulations which we hope would make a difference. But of course, there are ho hoops to jump through and the, the Lord President has to agree. Julia then, Elizabeth. So just picking up, first of all, on Lord Easy's point, I thought it would be helpful to describe the, the nature of the assessment. Um, as, as Rob said, uh, the SQE will have two stages. The first stage will be a test of legal knowledge, um, but the second stage will be a test of legal skills, and that will be it will not be computer-based assessment. It will be a, a, a skills assessment, so role plays uh, in relation to adv advocacy, interviewing, uh, testing uh, the candidate's ability to pick up a, a, a case to understand what the legal and factual issues are, what the risks are to the client and so on, as well as tests of legal writing, legal drafting, legal research. So that's the nature uh, 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 of the exam. But the, the, the point that I wanted to go on to make was that, of course, we do think that the SQE will assure standards better uh, and again, to pick up uh, Lord Easy's point, when we talked to uh, members of the public, three out of four of the people we spoke to when we did a, an opinion survey said they would have greater confidence in the solicitor's profession if they had all taken the same exam. So we do think there is a public confidence issue around this, and, and, and they told us that they would be more confident um, uh, in an SQE-type si system. Uh, but we do also think very strongly that the the SQE, the standardised exam, enables us 
to address the barriers to access in the current system. So it's really critical to issues around access. Uh, the two issues around access that we have identified are the cost of training in the current system and who gets training contracts. Cost of training, Tim mentioned £16,000 for the BPTC. I think that's actually now £19,000, Tim. I mean, I know it's very hard to keep track of these things because they do go up. It's £16,000 up to £16,000 now for the LPC. So that's an enormous cost on top of the cost of a, a, a degree. Look at barriers oh, and okay. they But I understand that your comments are, are very much looking at the system in, in England, Wales, yes. as it operates just now, yes. and the, the, the test on um, addressing that. Uh, but to move back to the, the diploma and some of these comments, Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah, Abley made the point about um, numbers and scale um, in terms of providers, six providers of the diploma in Scotland, 10 providers of the LLB degree, where I understand there's around 110 providers of the degree in England and 26 LPC providers currently. How that translates in terms of numbers, again, to give a sense of scale in terms of the profession, I think there's about 130,000 solicitors in England and Wales currently, and there's 11,000 in Scotland. Um, I'm happy to speak a bit about the accreditation process um, in terms of the involvement with, with uh, the Law Society as regulators. We certainly work very closely with the Law Society who prescribe our learning outcomes in both the LLB and degree, and every year we have to apply for re-accreditation re in, in order to provide the course. That is it's a, a fairly detailed process involving a very long submission of a, a report, generally around 30 pages, about the work that we've been doing the previous academic year based on feedback. Um, external examiner reports all have to be required to be submitted to the society. These are scrutinised in some detail by their Education and Standards uh, Committee, and then we receive a report on their terms, drawing our attention to any points, both uh, in terms of good practice, which are shared with all the diploma providers, and things that, that perhaps ought to be addressed in the forthcoming academic year. So we work very closely with them, and I think the close liaison between ourselves at the universities and the Law Society I mean it's a very well-regulated uh, profession and I like to think that certainly in terms of the trainees that are sent out into legal practice that they are um, regarded um, as very well versed in what they ought to be doing and that that is in the public interest uh, ultimately. Okay, uh, to move on to the flexibility issue that was touched on, John. Thank you, Convener. It's been touched on a few times here and I particularly had a question for the Law Society around uh, recent consultation. Uh, alternative routes to becoming, where the, and I quote here, the, the, the quote is, the route to qualification is not particularly flexible and does not promote equal access as well as it might. Now, equal access, of course, as you know, is a, a, a concern across various portfolios in the Parliament here. I wonder, could you expand on that, maybe say why you take that view, and indeed what other panel members think. Uh, and finally, if I may, convener of the, the Law Society can explain how the current more flexible ways to qualify work, for instance, the pre-peat training contract. Yeah, very happy to. I'll take it in reverse order, if that makes sense. So, <coughs> Pete um, is uh, the official name for the, the two-stage postgraduate process of the diploma and the traineeship. So, Pete 1 is the diploma, and Pete 2 is the training contract. Um, nobody outside uh, the Law Society's offices continues to call uh, those two elements, those things, but it's important because our view is what you learn in the vocational stage of PEAT 1, the diploma, you build upon and hone in the work-based stage of the training contract. And if you look at the outcomes of those two stages, they very clearly map across. Um, so one, there'll be negotiation in one, negotiation in the other, but the, 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 the how those will be assessed will be slightly different. The pre-PEAT uh, 1 training contract is um, something I, I think Tim alluded to before. Um, you can work in a legal office uh, for three to four years. It, it differs on the individual and take a series of Law Society of Scotland examinations. And at the end of those three to four years, uh, you have essentially reached the academic standard of the LLB. Uh, then, Tim's correct, you go on to do uh, the diploma and then most people will return to their original place of work or they'll do the diploma part-time and continue working. Um, could that process be smoother? Sure, yeah, of course it could be. Um, the difficulty that we have is that that is a very, very small number of people who take it forward each year. I take Tim's point entirely that comparing the English advocates profession, uh, the English barristers profession, the Scottish advocates profession is diff difficult simply because often there's four or five people in Scotland, maybe four or five hundred south of the border. People doing the pre-peat, 
if there's more than 10 in a given year, that is a bumper year. We're typically talking five, six, seven people at, at most. Um, and typically those people are already working in legal offices. They're, they're the, the court runner, they're the paralegal, they're the secretary, and the solicitor says, actually, you know what, you could be a solicitor. Let's put you through these exams, put you on this training contract. I have never seen anyone advertise for that role. So when we talk about equal access, I suppose, Law is a high-tariff, high-value degree and profession. Um, we know that, although there are contextualized admissions at many universities, which are to be commended, um, we know that talented people uh, may not be able to access the LLB, even with contextualized admissions, so, um, but could be fantastic solicitors in due course. So uh, could that be, uh, could those people be better? Uh, could, could they be solicitors? Uh, if the route to qualification was slightly more flexible and if we had a truly apprenticeship route, certainly we think so. Um, we know there are access issues throughout. Tim uh, and, and uh, Ben and others uh, led on the campaign for fair access a number of years ago. That made us do a number of things slightly differently. One of the things that came out of that was the consultation with the profession on uh, different routes to qualification. In the consultation, there were a number of suggested alternatives and we said to the profession, what do you think? Do you want an apprenticeship route? Do you want, for instance, accredited paralegals, which is a, a status that we uh, give to paralegals who can prove to us they meet a certain standard? Should there be some sort of articulation process for an accredited paralegal to become a solicitor if they so want? We shouldn't all think that a paralegal is a frustrated solicitor. Many of them are very happy being paralegals. Um, but could that process exist? As it happens, uh, the profession came back massively in favor of the apprenticeship route, less in favor of the other options available in that, in that process. So that's why we're focusing our energy on an apprenticeship route. Would that make access more equitable? I would hope so. Um, I suppose the proof of the pudding's in the eating, uh, but yeah, that, that, that's the main one for me. But hopefully that makes a bit more sense of the pre-peat uh, training contract. Happy with that. Perhaps if, uh, exploring the apprenticeship route yeah, a little yeah. bit I mean, more, Daniel? Uh, 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 um, just very interested to know how your plans lie in terms of developing a, a, an apprenticeship. Uh, when is that likely to be rolled out? What what will that potentially look like? I'm mean, assuming it's a graduate apprenticeship model you're looking at. If you could maybe just go into that in a little bit more depth. Yeah, um, absolutely. So the, the consultation happened. We looked at the, the responses and it was quite clear that was the, the route the uh, profession wanted to, to go down. Um, we went to the organisations that had... Uh, responded um, and said it's all very well uh, saying in theory we are in favour of an apprenticeship route um, because everybody is but will you if we create such a thing actually employ apprentices to do uh, to do this uh, I'm happy to say that a, a number of private practice law firms and in-house legal organisations have said they would be keen to scope that out with us and be keen to uh, to work with us. Where we are at the moment is we're working with, we're speaking to SDS, sorry, Skills Development Scotland, about how we do that. Should it be a modern apprenticeship? Sh should it be a graduate apprenticeship? At the moment, I think we're leaning towards a graduate apprenticeship. How that would work as any other apprenticeship would work. A number of years experience, probably five or six, I would say, five, six, somewhere around there, and uh, a series of examinations and assessments throughout the, the course. Um, more than that, there's not been too much, but we have got real sector buy-in to take it forward. Um, and indeed, some of the universities have said that they could play uh, a part of that in terms of the assessment out the way or the academics out the way, which are an important part of an apprenticeship too. So um, it's an exciting development. I, I can't say at this stage when it will occur uh, because we, we don't know. Uh, I wouldn't want to ha have, a, have a guess, but um, hopefully as, as soon as we can get the, everyone in line to do it, because we think it would make a huge difference. Um, I suppose it is worth noting, though, that there are only so many legal jobs in Scotland. Um, and a, a difficult conversation, I and it will be me, will have to have with law students in due course if we create an apprenticeship route, is it is likely, after a few years of an apprenticeship, that there will be fewer training contracts. Because if I'm a firm, you know, if I'm Mars and Co. and I take 10 trainees in a year, I might take three 
apprentices. I probably don't need 10 trainees and three apprentices. So this, the, how the profession may be slightly more diverse, people may access it slightly differently, but we're not going to magic up jobs, I don't think. So uh, that's a difficult conversation we're going to have to have uh, with the LLB and diploma cohorts in due course, um, but that's not a reason not to do it. It's just a reason, that something that we have to be aware of. So, so, so on that very point, I mean, I think there's a, a, a real risk that when people talk about apprenticeship routes in any profession, not just the legal profession, that they assume that by dint of having an apprenticeship route, that that will automatically uh, broaden access, where in reality, sharp elder middle class kids uh, and indeed their parents will go actually there's less uh, training contracts, but have you looked at that apprenticeship uh, route and actually you just get the very same people just going into the same profession, albeit by, by a different route. And I think there's a, some evidence of that with, with some uh, apprenticeship uh, routes already. Are there any sort of thoughts that you've had at this initial stage about how you can use this to genuinely widen access rather than essentially provide an alternative route to the same cohort of, uh, of people? It's a great question. Uh, it's not something we've given an enormous, uh, given where we are in discussions with SDS, that, that's something we haven't given too much thought to, but it's a, an entirely fair point um, that, uh, that, uh, that if you have numerous routes in, the same people may try different pathways. Um, at the same time, th there is evidence from jurisdictions that having multiple pathways uh, into uh, a, a profession, all that leads to is informal hierarchies uh, forming so that, yeah, of course, you can go to this route, that route, whatever route, but actually, if you don't go to this university and this uh, provider of training, be it law or another profession, you're not actually going to uh, go forward, uh, you know, in the same way every, you know, everyone can stay at the Ritz as long as they've got the fee to get in. Julia, you wanted to comment? Yeah, just to give a, a sense of how the apprenticeship model is working out in England and Wales. Um, um, we launched it in 2016. We had 25 apprenticeship starts that year on the solicitor's apprenticeship. We had 100 starts September 2017, and we're expecting numbers to go up again this year. Um, the firms that uh, offer apprenticeships are really evangelical about it. Uh, what they say is that it, it um, enables them to, to form the apprenticeships, uh, the apprentices in, in, in the um, competencies, skills that they need for their particular business. Those apprentices become very, very loyal to the, to the firm, and so they, it, it, it enables firms to hang on to talent in a way that they like. Um, um, in picking up Rob's point about fewer training contracts as a result of apprenticeships, I was on a panel with Womblebond Dickinson, one of the firms south of the border recently, and they said they had cut their formal training contract places by 20% to make space for people coming through alternative means. So I think there, there is some evidence that that will happen. I was on a panel yesterday with another firm who said that they have increased their number of uh, 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 training places to add apprenticeships to the training contracts they had. But uh, the so there's difference of practice there. Um, and picking up the point about sharp-held, elbowed middle-class people um, taking the, the apprenticeship routes, yes, I'm sure that there'll be some of that going on. But anecdotally, what we see in terms of the sorts of people taking up the apprenticeships at the moment are, um, um, first of all, um, predominantly uh, working-class people who are more likely to be worried about the fee debt uh, in England and Wales. So if they don't want to have the, la the, the large amount of tuition fees, they will go down to the, the, the apprenticeship route. They are people who have the choice of going to university or going down the apprenticeship route. They've got the grades to go to university, but they choose the apprenticeship route because they avoid the, the tuition fees, and that tends to be more of a worry for people from working class backgrounds and middle class backgrounds. And also, people who um, sometimes for ethnic reasons, because of ethnic um, cultural reasons, want to stay at home while they are working. Uh, and so again, that we, we see that model as well. Just as a brief supplement, can I ask what the profile of the firms offering those apprenticeships is? Are we talking magic circle? Is it sort of national kind of uh, uh, full service? Or is it sort of small firms or is it uh, yes, it, it's a very good question. Um, the, the, the magic circle, the top sort of five to six law firms tend not to be offering this list of apprenticeships, but we do have the nation, na big national law firms who are offering them and then smaller 
uh, firms as well. Uh, and the other thing, just to pick up, I think, also on, on, on Rob's very um, good point, is this idea of a hierarchy. Um, and for us, we were very concerned about that different perception of, of hierarchies according to which routes you followed. And again, that's, that's something we think is addressed through the solicitor's qualifying exam, the level playing field. Everybody who comes through, qualifies as solicitor, will be able to say, I've taken the same exam, and this demonstrates, this enables me to demonstrate I'm the equivalent, the equal of my peers. I wondered, Elizabeth, first from a university perspective generally, if you had any thoughts on the apprenticeship and, and uh, how would that affect or would it affect the university? It's hard to know. I think there'll always be an appetite to come and study. The, uh, traditionally, yes, the uh, traditional uh, yeah. route. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jenny, moving on to another aspect that's been covered. Thank you, Convener. Um, Rob Mars, I want to pick up on something in your submission with regard to barriers to access, um, because you point to your 2014 report on fair access to the legal profession, uh, which acknowledged that pupils from SIMD 20 and SIMD 40 were disproportionately less likely to even start an LLB uh, than their wealthier counterparts. And I, I just asked to, like to ask more generally then, the panel members, what, why is this still the case in 2018? I mean, uh, <clears throat> so far as I'm aware, uh, and this doesn't make it right or, or wrong, that the, the position for law is the position for many courses uh, across the uh, across the university sector. Um, that people from SIMD 20 backgrounds are, are less likely to commence th uh, the university experience. That's probably more likely to be the case in in in, in subjects like law, uh, medicine, etc. Um, you know. It's it's one of, you know, it's uh, that's what we identified in in the report as the as the the biggest single barrier. Um, you know, clearly there is a, a bottleneck at the end of the diploma getting into the training contract. Clearly, uh, there are uh, access concerns at the diploma. Uh, how I described it when I spoke publicly on the uh, the fair access report was in many ways the reach qualification as a triathlon. Uh, the, f the first bit is a swim, the second bit is a, a cycle, and the third bit is a run. Um, lots of people give lots of effort and uh, time to whether or not people can afford the bike. Uh, my focus in the report uh, that came through fairly clearly was that we should really be focusing on the people who can't swim, uh, because if they can't get in the pool, they're never gonna get to the diploma anyway. Um, why is it still like this in 2018? Um, you know, th there's any, any number of things. Uh, the attainment gap in schools um, that, that we inherit as, uh, as all universities and professions inherit uh, as inheritors of inequality. Um, on top of that, you know, I know that the university is doing a huge amount of work um, in this regard. It's fantastic to see so many universities undertake contextualized admissions. Um, and we've worked fairly hard in the area that we can do uh, to, to make sure that practice units or those who take trainees understand what contextualized admissions are. There is no point uh, a university saying, well, we're going to look at the whole individual, which is clearly the right thing to do um, on ter in terms of access to university. They do their degree. They get a first at the university. They go off and do the diploma. They apply for a training contract, and the training contract says, well, you need X m number of UCAS points. So we've worked f quite hard with the, uh, the profession to say, you almost want to forget, what, I mean, why look at school grades at all? But it's actually pernicious if you look at school grades when we know that most of the universities, if not all of the universities that provide the LLB, are contextualizing admissions in. So there are access issues down the line that we, uh, but I'm sure others will have a view on why it's still like this in 2018. Mm -hmm. Any other views around the table? No? Could we bring Rona and Anas yes, specifically? Yeah, Oh, sorry, Jim, you hadn't finished. Thank you. Um, so I, I'd also noticed from your submission um, that the Law Society has launched the Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisation, which funds eight students from poorer backgrounds. So you've got seven pupils there who were free school meal entitled. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, there were eight EMA recipients and um, there were three young carers. I was quite interested in the breakdown of, of these pupils um, and I recognise you're also hopeful to increase this cohort to 40 going forward. I just wondered how did you identify these pupils then? Uh, did they have to apply for the scheme? And did you target schools perhaps that were benefiting from the government's attainment fund? Because there's obviously a wider agenda here around closing the attainment gap and you mentioned that in your uh, previous response. We tried to get that out uh, in front of as many eyes as possible. We 
didn't want to hide the Law Scott Foundation away, so we worked with the schools that we work with through, through street law, through the Donald George Memorial debate, through the various universities who, uh, with the reach and pathways to the profession programs. Um, we promoted it um, via social media and all, uh, and all sorts of ways. I, can't, I, can't, I don't want to say that we did go to the, 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 uh, the, the scheme that you mentioned in case we didn't, but in the future we absolutely will. We want as many people knowing about the Law Scout Foundation and benefiting from the Law Scout Foundation as the charity can uh, support. Um, I'm you know, happy to say the first year there was eight people, eight remarkable young people, um, and then next year it'll be eight, the next year it'll be eight. So over the course of the years, it'll be, it'll be 40 when you add them all up. Uh, if we continue to raise funds from uh, the, the solicitor and advocates profession and others, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take anyone's uh, money in that regard. Um, you know, we, uh, we will try and support as many pupils as, uh, uh, as we can. It's important to note that it's not just finance. Uh, I, although finance is really important, um, we have set each individual up with a mentor for each year, and I think that mentor will change over the course of the five years, because then at that stage, they will uh, be beginning to form a network in the legal profession, which is hugely important. Um, the mentors who have come forward are from, from the, the highest uh, offices of uh, the, the legal offices in the land, uh, down to you know, newly qualified giving their time freely, and they add so much value. So, um, yeah, we're going to continue doing that, and we will, we will get it out to as, as many schools, uh, as many eyes as possible, because, uh, you know, as many people as possible should benefit from it. Thank you. Okay, Daniel. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask a, a supplementary, based on uh, what Jane Gilruth was asking, and actually referring to a previous point where we, we talked about the, the funnel, is the very fact that only 10 institutions offer the law degree actually kind of pre-screening kind of the number of people that can actually do a law degree and therefore go into the profession. I mean, to use your swimming analogy, it's not just, you know, on one hand, it may be that some people can't swim, but it also is that there's a limited number of places to take part in the race to begin with. Is that, is that maybe part of the problem? Uh, potentially. Um, if there are other universities in Scotland that do not offer the LLB, uh, if they wish to do so, uh, they would there is no market bar to them entering. They would have to come forward to be accredited by the society, but we don't say that there is a limit of 10. Uh, in the relatively recent past, Sterling also offered the diploma. They chose not to do so. Um, but uh, there, as I say, there are four or five universities off the top of my head that don't offer it. Could, could they offer the LLB? Uh, if they met the standards, we, we would accredit them. Um, I'm just conscious that in my nine years at the Law Society, the thing that I hear most often is that there are far too many law students. So um, if we then uh, explain, uh, which I'm not actually sure is the case uh, because of the, the point I raised earlier about the, the 40 to 50% who go off and study other things anyway or do other things anyway. Uh, but yeah, I accept that perhaps more, you know, more, more universities could do that. But that's a, that's a business and academic decision for the university. It would be entirely improper of us to turn around to a given university and say, you should offer the law degree. If they want to do that, and they think it would serve their local community and fits in with their long-term strategy, and they meet our standards, there would be no reason not to do it. My question is whether or not the Law Society should be seeking that, because my, under, my impression is that in, in England, there are a lot more lower tariff universities that offer law degrees, whereas in Scotland, it is pretty much the, the domain of the, the higher tariff, dare I say, more elite universities that, that offer uh, law degrees. And I'm just wondering whether or not there's a a possibility there in terms of opening up access? I, I wouldn't want to comment on uh, the, the tariff or otherwise of a, a given university. Uh, all I can say is that the law schools that come forward to us uh, require to meet uh, an initial accreditation standard and uh, uh, continue to do so over the course of their accreditation period until they choose not to do so. Um, others have considered it in the past. I mean, I'm, I'm bound by how much I can say there, but... Um, it's entirely up to them. We uh, we are neither pro nor against. We we regulate as we as we see the right way to regulate. Um, you wanted to come in. Um, quick point I wanted to make about. Um, we may come onto this in in in, fur in further questions about the structure with the diploma sitting as a postgraduate qualification after the LLB, and I just really pick up on on, on Rob's analogy about the triathlon and how. You, you need to be able to swim before you can think about buying the bike. I think I would just make the point, though, that if you are a pupil in fifth or sixth year at a school and you're not sure about whether law is the career for you, 
you are going to be looking ahead. And when it's explained to you, well, yes, your tuition fees are paid by for the Scottish Government for the LLB, you get your student loan, but come the end of that, you will have to pay for your diploma. You know, that will be a disincentive for people getting in the swimming pool at all, I think. Uh, so I do think that whilst I totally accept the, the, the inheritors of inequality point, being able to tell people at school that there's a structure that they can go through without having to inject lumps of cash uh, at the postgraduate level will be something that may help people who might be on the cusp of deciding whether they want to be a lawyer or not, that that's something that they could do. So I do think that the diploma structure and costs issue does have issues right back at the beginning, as well as for those when they finish the, the L LB. That's something Rona wants to come in, but I know Julia does. Can I, um, uh, does the Open University, um, is it starting LLB courses? Or uh, someone told me recently they were starting. The university offers an LLB, but that's an English and Welsh LLB. Right, got you. Julia and then. Picking up on this point about universities, um, I think that it's not just opening the number of uh, uh, um, universities that offer LLBs, it's also then a question of who gets recruited into training contracts at the end of the process. Um, and so we see in England and Wales that, um, first of all, you know, although we've got 110 universities offering LLBs, or qualifying law degrees as we call them, um, actually only about 19% of training contracts go to people outside the Russell Group of universities. And that, that statistic is mirrored by um, um, a piece of work that um, Hefke did looking at, um, uh, or the Department of Education, looking at the earnings of uh, uh, law students by university five years after they graduated. And the top university by earnings was Oxford, where five years out there, law graduates were earning an average of £61,000 a year. And the bottom was the University of Bradford, where they were earning, I think, sixteen or £17,000 a year. So the, the, the big question is, how do you encourage uh, the law firms to, 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 to recruit bright talent um, instead of just relying, if you like, on the university reputation as a proxy for talent. And we do hope that the Solicitor's Qualifying Examination will, will help with that. Mm -hmm. um, Rona. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, just to follow on, Tim, from what you were saying, um, your um, evidence acknowledges there's been an increase in student support, but you're, you're very worried about the negative effect that having to pay for the diploma will have. Um, in contrast to that, the, the Law Society... Said their, said their data shows that those from the lowest income backgrounds are just as likely to start the diploma as those from advantaged backgrounds. So I'm wondering, there's a wee bit of a disconnect there. What, what would be the well, reason um, for that? I mean, I suppose I can only speak, to, I mean, I haven't done, I don't have access to the same level of statistics that the Law Society do in their position as the regulator. I did certainly, um, when I was doing the campaign, I ran a survey and I can't claim that it was scientific, but of over 100 people within my diploma course and tried to reduce that data back to SIMD sort of numbers. And it did seem to me that um, there had been a drop off um, at, between the LLB and the diploma, but those were you know, within the limitations of what I could achieve as a student. And I accept that the Royal Society has better um, access to statistics than I do. But it seems to me um, uh, obvious that a financial barrier of the sort of magnitude of having to pay for the diploma must be a disincentive for people who are worried about the level of debt that they've got or who don't have access to funding to help them through that uh, or to avoid them taking debt beforehand. Um, now, when I was involved in campaigning on this issue, the level of student support for the diploma was about £3,400, I think, and that's against a cost of studying of, well, perhaps I know, the fees were £7,000 then and same again for the cost of living. So there's a big gap, about £10,000. Now, I, I do acknowledge that that student support is now much better than it was. So it's £10,000. But if we're saying that, I mean, the diploma fees at Edinburgh were, are over £8,000 now. Um, the Scottish Government's independent report on student support suggested that £8,000 and a bit was the sort of living wage for a student. So we're talking about £16,000. So there's still a £6,000 funding gap. And there's two questions there, I suppose. The first one is, you know, is, the, is student support the right way to fill that gap 
is there going to be more money that could help with that access issue? Um, and even should it be the government, the public purse, that is filling that access gap? Now, I think my view is maybe it shouldn't be. You know, the, di the diploma exists for a very good reason, and you know, going back into the history of it is because you know, a traineeship by itself wasn't delivering what the profession needed and what the public needed. So the Law Society at the time made the decision to introduce the diploma, and I think that was probably the right decision at the time. But there was no access issue then because it was all fully funded. It is not anymore. Um, and there's a question as to whether it, I suppose, it even should be. So, compare it to other professions, maybe accountancy or other professions where it's just a progression and there isn't that, you know, all of a sudden you hit a, a funding hurdle. Yes. Um, it seems to be a bit out of kilter. I don't know what, what you think of that, Rob. To, to, take, to go back to your initial point um, regarding progression, I can't speak for people who in S5 or S6 uh, find out about the route to qualification and here there is uh, a diploma that they require to pay for and a traineeship and choose not to do the LLB. Um, we have access to t statistics, but we don't have access to people we don't know exist. I, I'm not denying they exist, I just, we, it's just really difficult to find that out. The, the closest we can get, because of course the, the LLB takes a number of years, people might take time out uh, <coughs> upon graduating, uh, people might do a master's, whatever it may be. Uh, what we did a number of years ago uh, was we uh, just uh, asked the, 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 the 10 uh, LLB providers and the diploma providers for statistics. And when they didn't give us the st statistics, because it wasn't actually part of the accre accreditation requirements, uh, we, uh, uh, we just put in freedom of information requests. Um, so what we looked at was the number of uh, SIMD uh, 20 and SIMD 40 students who commenced the LLB in a given year. And then five years later, and I accept it's not perfect, um, we looked at the number of SIMD 20 and SIMD 40 people who commenced the diploma um, because we think that the vast majority of people do four years and then go straight on to the diploma. And what we found for the three years that we found data for was that actually people from SIMD 20 uh, and SIMD 40 backgrounds were slightly more, like, and it was very slightly, but slightly more likely to do, do the diploma than their more advantaged counterparts. Now, I can't say that there are some people who, from those backgrounds who choose not to go forward because of finances, and clearly that's something that needs to be addressed. But this, the years that we did that analyst, uh, analysis for, and with the caveat that it's not perfect, actually there didn't seem to be any drop-off rate over the course. Should more people from SMD20 and SMD40 backgrounds, or should, they be, uh, sh or should they be better represented on the LLB? Absolutely, I think everybody would agree with that. Um, in terms of how the training works, could it be done in another way? Could it be done like accountancy? Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's lots of ways to create a professional route to qualification. Um, right now, uh, I suppose it's best done by, having focused on statistics, it might be best done by an anecdote. Uh, I uh, was on a panel uh, at the Royal Faculty of Procurators last year and the, the motion for the debate was this house believes the qual route to qualification is not fit for purpose. Or, sorry, it is for, fit for purpose. So um, a sheriff stood up and said, actually, the quality of newly qualified lawyers is higher than I've ever seen. Um, a chair, the chairman of uh, one of Scotland's largest independent firms stood up and said, I have issues with the route to qualification, but uh, on balance, uh, the trainees that we get in on day one are of really high quality, and at the end of our training, we hope they're of a higher quality. And then a uh, professor of law at uh, Dundee University uh, was slightly more critical and gave us a qualified fit for purpose. Uh, I thought I'd gone along to be the Law Society patsy where everybody just sort of had a go at me and, and threw tomatoes. But then the three people in front of me all said we were actually turning out high quality lawyers, which is the primary purpose. Um, and then, this, you know, a, a, a really important secondary purpose, if you like, is, is, is access. There are access issues with all professions, regardless of how you put the, the process together. If you move to an accountancy model, there are issues with the accountancy model. If you move to... Uh, the medical model, which is five years undergrad uh, and, then, uh, and then training, it, it, it's, there, there's issues with that. Um, are there issues with ours? Yes, as, as we're discussing. But uh, at the moment, we feel uh, things are improving somewhat. And in terms of turning out high quality new lawyers, that is something we're doing. D would that not suggest that um, the legal profession is to some extent 
you know, raking in the benefits of um, students who are having to pay and then get, you know, as a trainee, don't get much money. And the law firms are getting a very high, I mean, which is good. Obviously, the, 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 the training is, is going well. But does it not suggest an imbalance? You know, that the, the law firms and perhaps universities are getting a lot of money for, um, from students who then go on to become skilled in the profession, but at a low cost to the, the profession? Is there not a, a, a balance, an imbalance there? To an extent, um, I write the paper each year for uh, the recommended rate of remuneration for trainees, um, and each year trainee solicitors around the country would be delighted to learn that I, I almost always uh, suggest an increase. Whether or not the Law Studies Council agrees with my recommended rate increase is a different matter, but I, uh, I have never uh, written a paper that hasn't suggested an increase. Should, so at the junior end of the profession, that, that, that's, uh, the, the pay is an issue, particularly when you look at other professions, particularly at, actually when you look at the city in London and the legal sector there. The important thing, I suppose, it, very similarly to Tim's point about the difficulty with the advocate's profession is on the one hand, devilling is unpaid, but on the other hand, you are getting, uh, I haven't done it, Tim has, fantastic training, uh, which you aren't paying for. So in the same way, the trainee solicitor, uh, yes, they... Uh, in terms of graduate salary are perhaps lower than other uh, roles that somebody could walk straight into. At the same time, they are getting a high quality professional training during that two years whilst being paid. Um, the issue with the diploma, I, I see your point entirely. Um, <coughs> until, unless until we move to a model uh, more akin to teaching where uh, the state picked up far more of the, the, the financial costs, uh, that, that's, that's I think where we are, um, but at, at the moment that, that that's where we are. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Liam, if you come in with your supplementary. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'm slightly disturbed by Rob's reference to um, our comparison with the teaching profession, where, in a sense, um, the state will pay because the state is providing um, the education that is, is is then delivered. I think the the, the point you make in relation to um, training is is well understood i think it, it's not unique to law that you you have in a sense a, a period where you're earning less with the expectation that on the back of that you'll receive the training that will enable you to um to, to earn more in future i think the the concern is that with a diploma which is a a professional requirement and um, that the, the 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 expectation to date has been that the, the state picks up um, the, the, the tab for that um, in a way that doesn't happen as, as, as you've acknowledged in, in, in other professions. Accountancy is the one that's, that's most often cited. And I think at times where um, budgets across the piece are under more strain, um, I think I I expecting the Law Society to move on from the consultation that you've had. Nobody doubts that there are uh, many options there, that there may not be a unanimity of, of, of you across Law Society members, but an expectation that at least recognising um, where public finances are at the moment, there'd be a, a, a willingness to engage in a model that, that, that eases some of that, that, that uh, pressure that's on, on the public purse at the moment. Is that not unreasonable? Can I perhaps add to that a little bit? You, know, you, you keep saying the aims of the current system is to ensure high standards, absolutely, and lawyers that are fit to practice the law. Now, we're in a very changing society, economically, depending on you know, the financial crisis or moving forward to the challenges of, of Brexit. Um, industry will have um, certain needs. So, at, at what stage do the law society and those people who give their accreditation and say, well, have we moved with the times? Are, are we back in jurisprudence of, of, of um, the very original, still teaching that? Because, yes, it's a basic, but are we also moving forward in that to, to address the need that industry has now for the proper legal advice from properly trained people to move on and see if there's a way to encourage that? Because, as you say, in the profession, there are a limited number of criminal lawyers that are needed perhaps commercial to an extent is touching on that. Have it, has it moved forward with the times to look at, to see if it's fit for purpose? I'm delighted to say yes. Um, <laughs> the, uh, in 2011, we reformed the Roots Qualification. Uh, the biggest single change there was, uh, those of you who, who qualified uh, around the table uh, will remember that the old elective system was you 
on your diploma, you had one el an elect literally an elective choice where you did public admin or company and commercial. So if you're going off to GLSS or the Crown, you did uh, public admin and everybody else did company and commercial. Um, but now up to 50% of uh, a diploma is elective content. So uh, that still has to meet certain standards, of course, but th that gives university providers so much more. Uh, over the last two weeks, uh, we have been, one of the, the annual pl uh, plan objectives for the society is to ensure content of the Roots qualification is uh, up to date. We held a number of round tables with um, academic and diploma providers and uh, practice units, both in-house and private practice, uh, on topics including uh, tax, have we got tax right at the moment? That's almost entirely taught in the diploma. Is that is that correct? Yes. How, do you, how do you judge that? Do you go and talk? How, how do you judge if you got it right? Well, we li we listen to our members and we listen to the academic providers. Uh, all the time we hear uh, people saying, we feel that the trainees coming in are light on this or, or heavy on that or, or good at this or perhaps could be better at that. Um, tax changed in 2011, so it's five, six years on, seven years on now, it's, it's right to say, well, was that change correct? Can we evaluate that? Uh, uh, do, you, do you go to the firms that would be seeking tax advice or the clients that would be seeking and saying, I find it difficult to get? I, I wouldn't de delineate that because um, tax is taught pervasively because tax is pervasive. So uh, I suppose the, the, the way I'd, I'd sum it up is we need all new lawyers to be tax aware lawyers we don't necessarily need to create lots and lots of tax lawyers although i presume because uh, that's what accountants are for yeah well, well let's uh, let, perhaps not but uh, <laughs> let, let's not get carried away uh, but um the uh, s but you know for instance if you're a private client lawyer you're going to need to have uh, a knowledge of tax if you're doing domestic conveyancing you're going to need a, a knowledge of tax if you're doing company and commercial you're going to need to know about business taxes and so forth um, as well as that, the, the biggest single transformative change in, the, uh, in legal, uh, as with all other sectors, will be the impact of technology. And whilst most of the LLB providers, I think, and I think all of the diploma providers are m doing more in legal tech, we've said, could we change our outcomes on technology? There are already some to make that more reflective of practice now and in the near future. Um, Tim and then Ben, um, this is a, a subject we're probably discussing today. Sorry, I I oh, sorry, Liam, did I, did I <laughs> did paraphrase what wasn't right? <laughs> in, sorry, I hadn't. Uh, uh, so, in terms of uh, my, my teaching analogy was simply, I couldn't think of any other professions where there is a postgraduate diploma and then uh, a, 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 a role. So the closest, although I accept that uh, it's a state profession on the whole, whereas we're a private profession on the whole, although there are uh, a good number of our members who go on to work for the state, either at local or central government or the Crown. Um, so, uh, I mean, for, for us, uh, I'd never uh, considered it from that perspective previously. So, uh, uh, in terms of sh should we create a root qualification because of the, the, the financial burdens of the state, um, I'm, I'm not sure that would be the, the primary motive on how we would create a, a root qualification, although obviously we have to be cognizant of what's going forward. I've said previously uh, when... Uh, law firms have said the route to qualification could be shorter or something like that. Um, you could do a three-year degree. You could do a three-year law degree. But the practice is in Scotland that people and the market and clients presumably want honours. But it is entirely possible to do a three-year law degree. So, and that would, that would reduce, in some ways, the cost to the public purse as well because it wouldn't be a fourth year of uh, the LLB. Liam, has that answered your question or not quite? Well, I'm not entirely sh sure that it, it, it does. I mean, there has been a debate about um, moving from a four to a three year degree across the piece, not simply in relation to, to law. Um, I, I mean, I'll be guided by others in terms of what is part of the academic requirement and what then is, as we, we were being told at the outset, the, the, the purpose of the diploma and how you weave that either into the, into the, um, the de degree or you have it as part of the, the, the training um, thereafter, and therefore it, it, it is it's captured in the part of the process where um, individuals will be earning something, if not a, a huge amount, and therefore the burden is, is not shouldered so much by the, by the state, by the public purse. Okay. Um, Tim and then Julie. 
I think it's um, important to just make the point that the cost of the diploma isn't the only issue. There is also the fact that most people who start the diploma do not start it knowing that they've got a traineeship at the end, and they can't know that. So it's it's undertaken by about, I think Alyssa's figures were about 70% of people who start the diploma do it speculatively, effectively hoping to then get a traineeship. Um, I think um, Rob's figures from the Law Society is 80% of people at the moment who do the diploma do get a traineeship, so that means 20% don't. And that's, of the people who start without one, that's about one in four. So there's not just the cost issue, there's that risk point as well. So again, if you're in that slightly more financially precarious position of, am I going to invest a year of my life and this money in doing this, I, when I don't know what the outcome's going to be, that I think is a barrier as much as, as the um, traineeship. And I think I, I just want to pick up on a couple of things about the, the diploma itself. I, I think I fully accept that there needs to be some sort of external educational input to that professional training that's currently provided the, by the diploma. But my question is the diploma the best way of doing that? You know, we've heard that 50% of the diploma is, is elective. Well, that's sort of a tacit admission that half the diploma isn't actually required to start D1. You know, it's good to have, nice to have, uh, good broadening education, but it's not required for day one. Um, we talk about it being a year. Well, actually, most of the courses start in September and are finished by the end of March. It's actually six months. So could some of those be taken and broken up and put into the same or a longer traineeship? And that's what we had proposed at one point previously was to do, you know, your traineeship during the day, but doing the diploma at the same time because you, make, you can do a part-time diploma, but the one job you can't do while doing a part-time diploma is being a trainee solicitor. Right. Julia Vicks. Just picking up on Tim's point um, uh, 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 around, uh, well, picking up on the point about the, uh, the length of law degree and also the, the electives, um, one of the things that we have discovered since we proposed the SQE is that universities are looking at integrating the professional stage of training into their law degree so that we will have, instead of four years to admission, three years. And actually some universities, I'm aware of one university who's even looking at a two-year uh, route to, to admission. Um, and one of the things that we have done is we have removed the requirement for the study of electives elective subjects for exactly the reason that, that Tim suggests. Um, and we can do all of this because we will keep a grip on standards. This, the, the standard through the SQE will be objectively and independently assessed so we can make sure that people are uh, at the right level for safe practice. But if universities think they can get through this in quicker time, shorter time, then it's open to them to do so. Mm. Yeah, and Elizabeth? Proposed model, if you like, that um, if effectively firms can somehow provide the, the diploma training part time, is that, is that your, am I picking up that incorrectly in terms of compressing that into? I'm not suggesting that model? the training no. is provided by the firms, the academic training is provided by the firms, but I think, and I, I don't know, I, I'm not an expert on this, but in the accountancy model, then people who are doing their accountancy traineeship will go and do the educational part with right. external providers, that, which could be the universities, but they would do it week at a time or day at a time, not for yeah. six months. I just wanted to point out the kind of intensive rigour of, of the diploma currently in relation to the core subjects. I think we're um, giving students contact hours um, to cover the core subjects of about 24 per week. So I think that would have to be looked at in terms of any kind of proposed model and the demands that professional firms now make on trainees to effectively fee earn and, and create funds. Okay. Ben, I'm going to bring you in. This is the subject we're discussing today um, because Ben has been very keen to look at it. So you finally get to answer your questions, Ben. Thank you, convener, and, and thank you all for contributions so far. It's been really interesting to uh, go through the subject and to hear the different pers perspective from England and Wales as well. I guess I would start from the point that uh, the reason all sorts of different people from different backgrounds going into train and qualify as a solicitor in Scotland, do the diploma in legal practices because in the vast majority, apart from the uh, various less popular and certainly um, less uh, numerous uh, other alternative routes and, and the fact that apprenticeships might become more prevalent is, is, is interesting and welcome. Uh, from my perspective, but the fact that in the, in the status quo, the, the, the vast majority of people have to go through the diploma is because they don't have a choice. You have to do the diploma 
in, in order to qualify as a solicitor in Scotland. And yes, I absolutely recognise that th this is creating quality graduates to then go on and, and, and undertake traineeships. But as uh, has been stated, it comes at high cost and to the state and the private individual and with risk in terms of getting a, a traineeship at the end. So I think what interests me more than anything else and has done throughout this process and when I was doing the diploma itself where you do do quite a lot of courses that you end up not using in terms of which avenue you may go into to practice in whether it's criminal or, or civil um, for the state or for a private firm. The, the point has been made that we could have a, a three year LLB but equally I've thought for some time that you could also have a three year traineeship that integrates with professional training uh, through the academic institutions with collaboration with the profession, where the profession is contributing to the high quality trained solicitor that will come out at the end of this process uh, rather than the private individual. And I think that's the place where this debate needs to go to is how are very uh, wealthy, successful organisations I appreciate for smaller firms it, it might be more challenging, but certainly for big firms, how are, are they contributing to this process and should they be contributing more? And that, that's the question that I would like to pose and, and hear more about um, what Tim proposed about the integrated approach, because I think that's where, where this question lies. Rob. Um, I'm bound to an extent by what I can say on it. I'm uh, the Secretary of the Education Training Committee that looked at this previously. Um, a number of organisations came to the society and looked to uh, propose uh, an integrated PEAT model, which, uh, as Ben says, m would merge to some extent the diploma and the training contract. Where that, it took some time uh, in terms of going back and forth between the groups and the committee. Where that got to, uh, I looked over the notes last night, uh, was that uh, the committee agreed in principle for the uh, for it to occur, but had a number of questions about how that could occur. Um, in the end, the firms involved, one dropped out, and the others uh, chose not to pursue that. Um, from uh, the questions that were raised by the committee were reasonable, uh, and uh, and as I say, they 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 agreed to do so in principle subject to those concerns being met. So clearly the committee is, is, is although committees change their membership all the time of course, but uh, I'm sure if that came up again they would, they would look at it again and they would look at it fairly again um, and they would, uh, they would consider it in the same manner. And if the questions and the concerns they had about how this impacted people and so forth were answered, they would, they would take that forward uh, and, and run either a pilot or, or more widely. I suppose the point that I missed earlier on was the, uh, the, to the, the, the cost to the state. Yes, there is an initial cost to the state, uh, but the state is not giving people money. They g it's giving people a loan. Um, my, I don't know the figures because this is a relatively new loan, but it's uh, sadly for us all, when we take out a loan, we have to pay it back. So over, over time, uh, this, that, that shouldn't cost the state. That should be returned, or the vast majority of it was, I know people default on loans, but on the whole, that's how the system should work. Um, I suppose, uh, just to follow up on Ben's point as well, we often uh, receive comments, uh, for instance, um, why did I need to do criminal law because I was going off to a commercial firm? Uh, that's particularly true of people who re-qualify into Scotland, people who are commercial partners in England and Wales and want to re-qualify into Scotland. Heaven forbid that a corporate client may want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, advice on laundering money uh, or anti-money uh, laundering or health and safety matters, um, which would both be criminal um, uh, and so forth. So, but ultimately, there are reserved areas to be solicitors. People want to be solicitors, and it's entirely appropriate that the public at large think that the solicitors should at least have a grounding in the areas that are reserved to them. Um, once you qualify, qualify as a solicitor, you are technically omnicompetent. You can work anywhere. Um, and again, whilst we would hope that people would not make poor professional decisions to go off having done a corporate traineeship to work in criminal defence law, um, the, 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 and we inculcate in them that that would be a very bad idea, um, 
ultimately, they are omnicompetent at that stage. And unless we move to some system of sectorized practicing certificate, which I think would be extremely problematic for many people uh, and for many reasons, that's why we have that broad ba base. So um, in terms of testing alternatives, the society has listened. Um, on the one occasion that it got quite far, in the end, the firms chose not to take that forward. Um, I can't speak to why they made that decision. Um, but uh, the committee is within its rights to ask reasonable questions about our new route to qualification <laughs> or a tested route to qualification. And then, Tim? Just, just very briefly, con convener, um, I mean, I, I agree that the, there is advantage in the omnicompetency and that wider understanding uh, in terms of uh, the, the solicitor who then qualifies. I guess I was just making the point that is there uh, an efficiency and uh, while keeping that breadth of knowledge, but a, a, a greater collaboration between integrating practice and professional training through the academic institutions and, and with a, a potential extended traineeship give advantage to both where you uh, continue to, to learn in a broad way, uh, but also in a focused way where you're applying that knowledge um, on, a, on a daily basis uh, as long as, as, as well as your, 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 your uh, professional and uh, academic progress. And uh, just on the point of the cost of state, I absolutely recognise and, and, and that the current um, arrangement is a, is, a, is a loan and I think that's the right proposal. I guess I, I was just be, uh, being cognizant of the fact that in the past, of course, it was, it was a, a grant and, yeah. I, I, and I'm, 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 I'm stating that I don't think we should go back to that place. Yeah, but no, point well made. Right, Tim, then Julia, and then Nordisi. Okay. I think on the uh, integrated approach, I completely agree that there's lots of advantages to doing that. I think the feedback between people doing something academically and then doing similar things in their office and bringing those two experiences together is, is very important. I think it also eliminates at a single stroke this question of of the barrier caused by the structure in that if you're on, if you've selected and recruited into one of these integrated traineeships, if that's what they become, then you know you've got a traineeship. And of course you're then earning a salary. So even if you know, there isn't a, a government loan, you, you know, your firm may pay for it, or you may have a salary out of which to pay for your own training. And again, I think that's what happens in accountancy. Some of the bigger firms will pay for their trainees to do their training, others will have given them a salary and expect them to pay for their own tuition and exams. Um, so I think that's a number, there are a number of advantages to that integrated approach. And on the particular proposal, obviously I was very involved with that. Um, I think um, our feeling from the people producing that proposal was that um, the level of detail that we were being asked to give of a scheme that we were designing ourselves was just completely um, too, there was too much that was being asked of the firms and that, that's why I, I suggested that it was a risk aversion really and I think my disappointment was that we had education and training professionals from three of Scotland's main law firms saying yes we can do this and the committee effectively didn't accept that. So that's really going back to the Law Society, but I bring Julian first yeah, and just then Lord Easy. Pardon. Uh, just to say that south of the border, uh, it's been possible for many years to do a part-time training contract and a part-time legal practice course. So we do see people doing, it's, it's not an integrated programme between the two, but actually we do see people in that sort of model doing a, a training contract, getting some time out of the office and going and doing their legal practice course, either at weekends or in the evenings or indeed during the workday, and it doesn't seem to have caused any difficulties. Lord Easy? <coughs> yes, yeah, so one or two uh, points, if I could just mention briefly, convener. Firstly, on, I think at the earlier time there was indeed grant support for a limited number of diploma students, uh, and that, I think, was the situation at the time of, of your campaign. Uh, and certainly at that time, myself and the vice convener of the committee had meetings with the then Cabinet Secretary uh, for Education. Uh, and the view was taken in government at that time that it, one wasn't making an exception for law and that it should be equiparated with other professions where there was a postgraduate vocational course such as education. And indeed, I think since then, uh, the loan system has seemed to work better than the grant 
for many people. The next point, <coughs> they're not necessarily all related, these, uh, is on uh, looking at it from the point of view of education for lawyers in general. It's quite important, in my view, that one builds in adaptability for the future. The fact of the matter is that when you bark in law, you don't really know where you're going to end up at. And uh, you have to adapt to very many different situations. And looking back on my past, I can say that uh, very little of what I learned, uh, or at least much of what I now know and have operated on both as a judge and as a, an advocate, uh, was new material for which I was equipped by the general study of law. And finally, uh, for the moment anyway, uh, I think I may be the only person in this room who's old enough uh, to remember when there wasn't a diploma. Because indeed when I qualified, there was no diploma. Uh, and can I say that I think if no one would want to go back uh, to the situation before, it was unsatisfactory both for the universities who found themselves trying to teach a little bit of practice and it was very unsatisfactory for the profession because the quality of training that was provided by what was then called an apprenticeship um, was very, very variable depending on one's apprentice master, as they were known. There were very few apprentice mistresses. <laughs> and uh, so it, it is something which is, I think, very worthwhile retaining. It was made a great improvement to legal education in this country. Okay, and Rob? Uh, no, I had my uh, hand up, but uh, I probably said too much already. Okay. <laughs> well, with that, can I thank all the witnesses very much for what's been a superb round table. We've gone lots of different directions, lots of uh, food for thought, and lots of reassurance too in some, in, in some respects. So thank you all very much for attending and can we suspend now briefly for a comfort break and to allow the witnesses to leave.
Agenda item three is to ask the committee's agreement to delegate powers to me to pay witness expenses for the round table um, under th rule 31243. That's the round table we've just had. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number four is consideration of a negative instrument. This is the act of sederant fees of solicitors in the court of session, sheriff of peer, Court and Sheriff Court Amendment 2018 SSI 2018 Oblique 186 and I refer members to Paper 3 which is a note by the clerk. But before I invite any comments from the committee, um, can I just say that having asked the clerks about this particular SSI and in the context of the discussions we've had in the conveners group generally about the, the notes accompanying these SSIs and how easy it is to understand in layman's language exactly what they're intended to do, then uh, this is a prime of example of what shouldn't really be happening. Uh, the, the point has been made to officials and the clerks, I've asked them to, to bring it up with the officials that when we're looking at these SSIs, then it should be clear what the policy intent is, what the SSI is intended to do, and that should be clearly set out for committee members to understand or for any of the public who may be looking at the SSI to understand. And that point, as I see, has been made to officials. So on the back of this particular one, I've asked the clerks to write to the Lord President and the Minister of Parliamentary Business, making the general point that we expect these SSIs to be accompanied by a clear explanation about what the instrument does and why. And this is a particularly important issue because there is no doubt that in the coming weeks and months, the number of SSIs we will be dealing with, in fact, every committee will be dealing with, is going to increase substantially. So I think the, the point really must be now, made now that um, in relation to the SSIs that the Parliament will update the statute book because of the UK decisions to leave the EU, uh, we're aware this is uh, an issue that's going to grow. So a letter will go to the Lord President to make that point about the clarity to be easily understood and about the general, um, raising awareness about the general point that these SSIs are going to be a bigger factor in our business dealing with it. We already deal with a, a large number in this committee and the clerks really shouldn't have to be making phone calls and spending time trying to determine exactly what the SSI does. And with that, can I have comments from members? Daniel. Uh, Camino, thank you. I, I'd just like to make one broad comment and I understand that this SSI uh, is making provision for a 5% increase in fees uh, across the board. And I'd just like to make the general point that court fees uh, can present uh, an access to justice issue. They have, uh, we've uh, seen above inflation increases in fees for a, a number of years now. And, and while I understand the need that, uh, for the courts to recoup their fees, and I under also understand the decrease in the number of cases brought forward, um, I do think we should note um, that this can be an issue for people um, and, and that should be borne in mind uh, in the future. Right. Any other? John? Yes, no, I, I, I would absolutely echo what um, uh, Daniel has, has said there, and I think we need to be vigilant about this. It's not something that we see in, in, uh, replicated in um, salary increases and the like. But I would also like to make a, a passing comment about your earlier remark in general about SIs, about, and this is a situation that has come up in other committees, and uh, um, so it's not simply from the Lord President's office. I know you're not suggesting that, but um, in the past you would look to an explanatory note to explain, uh, increasingly they seem to replicate what it says in the, the SI, which is less than helpful. And I think your comment also about the public watching these proceedings, you know, of course we understand there will be some highly technical legal matters, but we need to understand the generality of what's been proposed there. And if we have any questions to then delve deeper. So that's very helpful, Camina. Yeah, the, the committee has already, uh, or the clerks have already taken up the, the point with government officials, so the Lord President is an next person in, in our sights. Liam. Uh, very briefly, convener, just, uh, I may not be understanding your point, Daniel Johnson, um, entirely, but uh, th this SSI, <coughs> to some extent, it goes towards the, the clarity. I, I read it as the 
um, applying only to the fees of the solicitors in an award of expenses at the end, rather than the court fees that are levied to access. Uh, uh, so I was just a bit confused by yeah. Daniel's point. Gail will give complete um, clarification. I think that is the case, Lynn. Yes, that's the case. So this is about um, the tables that the court used to determine the award of a solicitor's expenses at the end of the case, rather than the court fees that individual litigants have to pay for the different stages of court proceedings. Yeah. So it's not necessarily an access to justice issue. Um, I mean, in terms of, I suppose, the litigant saying, OK, what am I in the hole for at the end of this, potentially? Uh, I, I concede that point. Well, I think it just demonstrates the point that that was not clear in the briefing papers that we got. Uh, and therefore, you know, if, if we're asked to pass these SSIs and know exactly what we are being asked to pass, it must be absolutely crystal clear. So thank you for that. More generally, where there is court fees, the issues going up, there has been a tendency for that to happen. Your point is well taken, but perhaps not relevant for this SFI. So with that, are you um, content not to make any re recommendations with regards to this SSI other than the general point about clarity of the explanatory note. Content? Thank you for that. Agenda item five is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing and, uh, of its meeting on 21st of June 2018. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions. I refer members to paper four, which is noted by the clerk, and ask John Finney to provide feedback. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, uh, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 21st of June and we took evidence on uh, Police Scotland's digital data and ICT strategy and also took further evidence on the Police Scotland's use of digital device triage systems, which uh, are no, also known as cyber kiosks. And that evidence was taken from Kenneth Hogg, the Interim Chief Officer at the Police Authority, uh, David Page, Deputy Chief Officer, Martin Lowe, Acting Director of ICT, James Gray, Chief Financial Officer, and Detective uh, Chief Superintendent Jerry McLean, Head of Organised Crime and Counter-Terrorism from Police Scotland. And the subcommittee heard that the ICT strategy <coughs> excuse me, is much bigger than the previous I6 programme in terms of scale and investment, and the police, uh, Scottish Police Authority Board is to consider the strategy again in the autumn when it contains more detail and greater clarity uh, on costs. The subcommittee also uh, considered the level and detail of scrutiny that was undertaken by the Scottish Police Authority before investing in cyber chaos with a view into introducing their use throughout Scotland. And uh, I think it's fair to record we're disappointed that there had been no impact assessments undertaken before the two trials um, or as part of the consideration to expand the use of cyber kiosks. We now we're assured that these are being compiled and will be en route to the subcommittee for scrutiny. Um, so, um, and these assessments were a privacy impact and data assessments from Police Scotland um, about cyber kiosks. And the subcommittee also considered its forward work programme and I agreed to write to the Police Authority and Police Scotland about their joint decision not to make ex gratia payments to the four officers affected by the counter-corruption unit investigation. Um, and the subcommittee will meet again on the 13th of September. I'm happy to answer any questions. Camilla. Thank you, John. Do members have any comments? Daniel. And just one brief comment, which I made uh, during the, the, the Justice uh, subcommittee um, meeting itself, which is that the, the, the scale of this investment will make it one of the largest IT projects to be undertaken uh, within the, the, the public sector in, in Scotland and indeed uh, more broadly within the UK and as such. And I think given also the, the issues of the past, I think that the, the, this IT investment programme does merit, I think, further scrutiny, not just by the subcommittee, but maybe we'll want to consider whether or not it, it's something that the, 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 the committee as a whole needs to take, a, at least a very least a watching brief, if not more. Uh, uh, scrutiny over? Well, the committee will be undertaking post-legislative scrutiny on the Police and Fire Bill anyway, uh, Act rather, and how that's operated in the last five years. So I've no doubt a lot of issues will come up in including this, but there was certainly a little bit of concern, more than perhaps a little bit of concern, about the, the scrutiny of this particular project and if there wasn't a case of cart before horse really and um, so something that I think given the value of the contract as Daniel says needs so a watching brief are there any more 
comments? If not, then um, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be after the summer recess and it's currently scheduled for Thursday the 6th of September when the committee will hold its uh, rescheduled se se uh, session with the Secretary of State for Scotland on Brexit and justice matters. So it only remains for me to wish all members and staff, clerks, um, a relaxing and stress-free recess and we now move into private session. <laughs>